James Burgess. I'm the president and CEO of American Biomedical Group. And uh, we're going to kind of do a little mixed proposal here of some of the things that, that we're involved in. And uh, I have my son to my right who's going to talk about our all track system, which is tracking patients and disease states and surgical sets and trays. We got Ron Doyler here with TGF uh, McCall who does uh, virus tracking, um, not from a security standpoint, from, but, but Zika virus and Ebola and, and Marlboro viruses and other hemorrhagics and stuff like that. And I have Paul Eaton. Um, Paul is a consultant for ABGI and he, uh, he's going to talk about dark winter, which is the biological and chemical warfare simulation that occurred in 2001. And so. I'm going to introduce our company a little bit and then uh, and tell you about us and, and then I'm going to hand the, the microphone over to each uh, and every one of the people. So, okay, um, I'm going to turn around here. ABGI is a 30 year old technology management company. We're headquartered in Oklahoma City. Um, we have five business areas. We have a biomedical group. We do biomedical and maintenance for all the high-tech systems um, for the U.S. Army Material Command for 30 years, and uh, we'll we'll show a little bit about that. Um, we have Tag and Track, which is RFID, where we're using ultra wideband that's FDA approved in the operating rooms and surgery areas. Uh, it has no leakage current, and uh, we'll discuss the the ultra wideband tracking systems of tracking. Patients, surgical sets and trays, uh, prosthetics, medicines, uh, case cart management systems for cost containment. We have a security and weapons tracking group where class three firearms uh, uh, and, uh, and federal firearms license dealer one, three, and six. And uh, we do a lot of tracking work for the military on, uh, on weapon systems at uh, some of the bases. And we have a cattle track division, which somebody says, well, what are biomedical engineers working with, with cattle? Well, we're also ranchers, and we come from Oklahoma and Texas area, and, and we raise cattle. But we've got involved with Texas A&M, Ohio State, uh, Oklahoma State, North Dakota State University on, on, on containing and tracking and managing diseases in feedlot situations using our tracking devices, mostly bovine respiratory disease known as BRD and bovine viral diarrhea. I know we're having dinner right here, so I won't talk much on that. But it's, it's a hundred billion dollar industry and it's a worldwide industry with a, a lot of uh, cattle and that in South America and Central America and the U.S. Um, it rivals the oil industry and it's, it's key to our food production and safety. The other thing, we have a Merimed insurance. Um, after 2001 uh, attack that um, we were, we had Lloyd's of London insure our products for the guaranteed performance of our products for 20 years and we formed our own offshore insurance captive in Bermuda and, uh, and we insure the we're the only ones to ensure the U.S. government and U.S. Army on the systems that we maintain for performance. And uh, it's an aggregate stop loss and uh, it, if there's a failure, we maintain it even if it exceeds the cost that we, we capitate it at. Um, we're a small, flexible, and diverse talent organization, mostly in biomedical, electronics, RF, and ISR engineers, including 15 advanced degrees. Uh, we're, we have a lot of retired military. Uh, we had a lot of clearances with our group. Um, ABGI and Tag and Track engineers have been awarded more than eight patents now, but we have, uh, where I think we're up to about 14 of them, and I think we're approaching 17. Um, we have performance bond that guarantees our performance up to 50 million, and that's for our Merrimed and Lloyd's stop loss. Um, we have development facilities. Our corporate office is in Oklahoma City. We have an office at the Naval Air Station, Joint Strike Station, and Fort Worth at Coswell. And then uh, we uh, also have uh, personnel at um, Greenville, Texas, by the L3 plant on the other side of Texas. And we have people in Milwaukee and in Colorado also. Um, serving commercial and government facilities in 24 states, including the U.S. Army Medical Research Command. Uh, we've been a prime maintainer there for in excess of 14 years. Um, and then the U.S. Army Medical Research of Chemical Defense at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Walter Reed Institute of Research in Silver Springs, and, and weapons tracking systems at Fort Sill. i flip over, Jimmy, next. Uh, we're going to talk about pandemic preparation response, biowarfare and terrorism, predictive analytic 
for outbreaks, preventive isolation and control units, and tracking equipment, patients, and staff. Next one. Okay, Paul's going to talk about the bio warfare and terrorism part of it. Um, is the next one a map of the bio? Okay. We're going to show you first before Paul, I hand the microphone to Paul. These are the Centers for Biological and Chemical Defense in the United States that, that we maintain and track and ports of entry just to give a, an idea of, of what we've been doing for the last 30 years. Next slide, Jimmy. And uh, these are some of the disease outbreaks that have occurred just recently with outbreaks, cases, and deaths from viral and bacterial diseases, um, which could indicate bioterrorism in the United States. And so some of these are the areas that we, that we, uh, we are tracking and monitoring of what's occurring. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul Eaton, and Paul will talk about the uh, um, Dark Winter, which is the simulated biological and chemical warfare games that, that were done in 2001. Paul? Thank you, Jim. Has anybody heard of Dark Winter? Okay. In 2001, I was working with a company in Washington, D.C., and also assisting a very senior um, naval officer in, uh, with the White House in uh, development of a presidential decision directive to establish Department of Homeland Security. The government came to our company and asked us to develop a game we called it a war game, but they didn't like the name war game. So we just called it a game in which we could test the executive level of the government in biowarfare slash terrorism. The government assembled uh, a group of senior executives who were either active or retired to act in the capacity as the President of the United States and the National Security Council. The Council was in session conducting uh, discussions relative to a foreign threat. We introduced the first act of three acts of the scenario. The first act was a television commercial using um, very polished and good uh, television people as part of it to discuss the fact that there was an outbreak of an unknown disease in Oklahoma City. And there were at that point 12 to 15 people that were uh, infected. But it was serious because nobody knew what it was. In the first day of the scenario, as it is in session, we also added to it that doctors had finally determined it was smallpox. Well, what was the reaction of the National Security Council? Very little reaction, because they had not been engaged in things like biomedical or biowarfare involvement. They'd principally been involved in national security from the standpoint of other countries and their threat to the United States militaristically. We shifted to day two, and in day two we had over 200 cases in uh, Oklahoma City and surrounding areas, also an indication that it was in a couple or three or four more states. This got a little bit more attention because we were also seeing some deaths, and they started talking about when was the last case of smallpox in the United States. It was 1949. Well. What are we going to do about it? When was the last time people in the United States were inoc inoculated? I think it was 1972. So everyone who was in that age group, I mean, I got my scar on my shoulder, um, they were going to be casualties because they had never been inoculated. So the question started now raising, well, how much vaccine do we have? They found out that we didn't have enough to go around. And then the President of the United States, who was acting in the capacity, who was, who was acting in the capacity, that was Sam Nunn, um, they decided that, well, we should probably get the vaccine and get the people in executive level in Washington, D.C., I thought that was funny, as well as the national security, uh, uh, the military inoculated. Well, there wasn't enough vaccine to inoculate the military. Because what they were sensing and seeing is the possibility of a terrorist, uh, I'm not a terrorist, but an activity in the United States which could be very disruptive to the society as a whole. We now shifted six days later 
We had 144,000 cases across the entire United States because of spreading because no one had bothered to shut down the airlines and it was moving by airlines. It was moving into foreign countries who were basically upset with us and wanting us to provide the vaccines, which we didn't have and couldn't produce effectively. And on and on and on, the economy was slowing. Borders were being closed in Oklahoma because no one wanted, and people were trying to exit, but no one wanted them in other states. And you had state troopers and guards on the, on the, on the highway is not allowing transportation or the agriculture in, in and out of Oklahoma to occur. It was concluded that this was a national disaster and that it was going to get worse. So biowarfare and bioterrorism became a pretty big watchword at that particular juncture. There were lessons learned, and I'm going to go over a few of those. But the bottom line is we did not have the vaccination capacity, nor do we have the structure to deal with a bioterrorism to IE warfare attack in the United States. And it would be catastrophic. We had minimum ways to detect and identify one of the reasons why is because physicians were not being taught how to identify these diseases because, remember, they had been eradicated in the United States since 1949. Okay? We had, we had other instances where we couldn't figure out how to localize them, track them, isolate them, or control them. In the United States totally, I think there's something, Jim, correct me, about 12 total isolated control units because they cost a fortune to develop and you need something that's cost effective and you need a contingency plan. But some of the developments that occurred and the, and the lessons learned in 2001, remember, was that a bio attack on the United States would cripple the country. I think that's very true. That a local bi uh, bio a biological warfare attack would cause tremendous ha hacking or ha uh, havoc locally and that our government was not responsive enough to deal with these issues. He went on to discuss that we're ill-equipped to prevent these dire circumstances from a biological warfare attack. We lacked the resources and stockpiles to deal with them effectively, and that we would probably have to come up with some forcible constraints on people to start becoming vaccinated again. The current strategies and plans we did not have. We didn't have an organization that was effectively doing it. And one of the most interesting things was is that they concluded that perhaps they needed to have someone with a medical background as a member of the National Security Council. Because remember, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, all these other agencies, State Department, this isn't their area of responsibility. So I think they may have added the CDC to the National Security Council, which is probably the only thing that has occurred since, since 2001. Let's fast forward to today. Today we have borders that are manned but unmanned. We have undocumented aliens, UDAs, coming into this country in leaps and bounds with diseases that we don't know how to track. We don't know how to localize and we're not doing that. We have terrorist groups on our borders. It would seem to me that it would be more advantageous for them to bring a vial of a, of a, a toxin into the United States versus trying to buy, buy high explosives in the United States and cause havoc. And by the way, it would cause a lot more havoc with a biowarfare attack. So what I'll leave you with today is what is our contingency plan and what activity in the federal government or the state government or the local government is taking this problem seriously? Are we going to try to wait till we have another situation, raise the yellow flags or, and put the yellow ribbons on the trees and say we're going to, we're going to be victorious? The unfortunate part with an infectious disease is once it starts, you can't put it back in the bottle. With this, I'd like to turn it over to Jim Burgess. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Jimmy, go to the next. Yeah, this, this is a map of, of what's currently happening um, with human disease cases from coming over the border. And a lot of you don't know us, but basically, uh, we spend a lot of time down along the border. Um, the border is 
We're, we're in the Big Bend territory. Let me get the little, for those of you that don't know where Big Bend is, it's National Park right here. And it's 40, 44 square miles, 900,000 acres, and there's a lot of people transacting and crossing it. So we worked with the Border Patrol to uh, identify um, different people that are, are entering our country without signing the guest list. And we don't have a political agenda here, you know. I think anybody that's an immigrant, as long as they sign the guest list and that, that they get checked out from a medical standpoint because the diseases are zoonotic diseases that are crossing into our borders. Zoonotics are diseases that cross over between animals and humans, and there's about a thousand of them. But most of them are things that you know, tuberculosis, rabies, um, dinghy fever, yellow fever, malaria, uh, a lot of the um, venereal diseases, um, and, and these individuals are coming across our border, and these cases are showing up. The areas that are marked in green are the number of active cases. In California, Arizona get hit pretty hard. In Texas, they, they, they get a lot, and, and also Florida. But, but a zoonotic disease is, is diseases that are cross over and affect our economy. In fact, um, there's been a study done that if we were to eradicate a hundred of the zoonotics that are crossing over, that we would probably put a trillion dollars into our net economy from lost productivity, you know, um, use of uh, our medical systems and the cost associated with that. So this is this is a highly important aspect. It's not just that somebody's coming in, whether they're politically correct, illegal or not illegal, but it's what they're carrying. And the big outbreaks are whooping cough, measles, rubella, um, you know, all kinds, scarlet fever, you know, and those are things, mumps, and I mean, these are huge outbreaks. I'm talking about, you know, 75,000 cases to 100,000 plus cases are coming into the United States, and people don't know it's not being reported. The border guards bring it home after they interdict somebody, and they give it to the kids, it ends up in the schools, and then it spreads like wildfire. And so, you know, we were trying to formulate a plan of how to protect the United States, not from... Um, intentional terrorism, but unintentional things that are coming across our border. And zoonotics don't just include bacteria and viruses, they include fungus and parasites. A lot of parasites are coming across. And they affect our, our, our industries and our food supply. I'll give you an example. In El Paso, Texas, we have a lot of cattle that are, that are in El Paso, and they milk the cattle, they're milk cows, and it's the cheese for our pizzas all over. Well, a lot of the herd got tuberculosis because somebody defecated in the bunks that had TB. And it was a TB, a pharma TB, that, that even John Hopkins couldn't put together the correct medicine to eradicate. Very resistant forms of, of the disease. And I think that's the thing that, that, that's occurring, and, and that's why everybody should be, you know, looked at before they're allowed to go forward in our country. Uh, next slide, Jimmy. So what we did is, is we tried to create a cost-effective system, and we did this for, for military purposes to you know, help eradicate Ebola in Africa. And the cost of building you know, a class four isolation containment facility is very expensive. OU Health Science Center put one in their parking garage. It was 850000 with an existing structure. And we built these class four containment units for about sixty to seventy-five thousand dollars, and they're mobile. They're stackable. They have, um, you know, class four containment means you know no biologicals in or out. Airflow is sterilized. Um, it, it, it's it's quite a quite a containment facility. Nothing goes in and out. Has an ante room for somebody to come on, put clean clothes on, go in. Um, they go into the patient room. They treat the patient. They come out, and they're they're UV lighted, and they have a 10% Clorox solution washed down. Closer, put in a a, a system, and it incinerates. So, you want to go to the next picture? We use. We use ultraviolet germicidal radiation for all surfaces and airflow. Next picture, Jimmy. Um, how it affects it, it stops the, uh, the ability of the cells to multiply um, by affecting our DNA. Next picture. Uh, we use a, a jet ceiling that circulates the air. The air has uh, HEPTA filters with 99.9% .9 at 0 .03 microns of filtration down to the virus level. And so it's getting sterilized by the, the UGV system and it has HEPTA filtration systems all throughout it. So it doesn't 
get away from the containment facility. Everything stays inside the containment facility. Next picture. Um, I'll use the little slide here. Um, basically, we have a air handling system that has the HEPTA filter and Clinetics UV tech air sterilization system that's used in every major hospital in the country um, in areas where there's special clean rooms. Uh, you have the ductwork that's stainless steel welded together that, that can be sprayed down with quaternary ammonia chlorides also. Um, we have the recirculating UV tech sealing unit, the farmer's grade composite wall panels, and all the doors are electronically interlocked. Once you come in the ante room and go into the patient room, and you have to come back out. It's all interlocked. You can't go back into the clean area. You have to come directly all the way through and be um, decontaminated. Next picture. This is, is this a basic box. So we, this is the ante room, this is the patient room, and this is the clean room. Next picture, Jimmy. Basically, all the, all the supplies and that are stacked on shelves. It's an ante room where you change clothes and get into your mask or your, your class four containment unit and, uh, and then exit in, the door locks automatically. Next picture. Basically, um, you come in, you treat the patient. After you treat the patient, and we have camera systems and everything else in here to monitor the patient as well as uh, telemetry systems. Then you come out, we have incinerating toilets and we have floor drains and that that are incinerated. And uh, we have a gas sterilization system that, that we can gas the area down if the patient dies and, and you have to put them in a special bag. But then you exit out of the ante room here. So everything is contained, water, everything. And everything is incinerated or, or, or quaternary ammonia chloride. Next picture. This is it, it's a basic box. It's made to fit in an airplane and be airlifted to wherever you need or put it on the back of a truck. You can put four of these on a containment truck and put them out wherever you need it, down along the border. And you can put them out in the parking lot. You don't infect your hospital by bringing the patients into the hospital and then expose all kinds of people to it. You can put in the parking lot, they're contained. Um, it has where you can stack these units alongside each other. It has mechanical rooms that link up and, and supply the whole scenario. There could be 12 of them stacked. And this is a very cheap, quick alternative to contain a class four biological threat. That's Ebola, Marlboro virus, Lassa fever, a lot of the different um, class fours. And it's, and it's a very important, um, cheap way to do that, that that contains everything inside. Next picture. Uh, this is this is the bathroom. It's a very simple sink, uh, incinerating toilet. We have underneath the floor. We have our water and our, our cistern systems that incinerate everything. We have showers and we have an above shower that also helps. That you can use a 10% Clorox solution to wash everything down before you take your suits off and bag everything. Next picture. This is the clean ante room that you come into initially, and basically you you change clothes and we have shelving units over here and case cart management of supplies that are needed to go into the area. Next picture. And that, that's, that's a cheap, simple alternative that we have yet to make after, what, 2001, what is that, 15 years now, that we have not really set up a system to help um, block or, or manage disease states that come in that are very contagious and infectious and spread like crazy. I know I just got a briefing just recently that there was a, in Cascade County in Montana, there's an anthrax outbreak. And, you know, we haven't had one of those. And we had a hantavirus outbreak there, too. Those are, those are death sentences. The, not so much the anthrax, but the, the hantavirus is, is usually kills the, kills the people. And so of the map that I showed you, those are the ones that are actively going on that are being brought into our healthcare systems through our emergency room, sitting in our waiting room, that could cause exposure. And this is a... a one of the threat things that we are working on to help control and contain and protect uh, you know, the, the personnel of the United States. I'm going to introduce Ron Doyler here. And, and, and Ron, we worked with uh, in developing a, a software package in, in a group out of Honduras for tracking Zika virus, Ebola, um, Marble virus, dengue fever, malaria, yellow fever that's coming on board. And his group put together a software and been working in the Central American countries and Latin American countries to do a tracking system so we can see the progression of spread. And with that, Ron, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ron Doyler. I'm the president of TGF Macaw Soft US. 
We specialize in uh, medical software. We do create other softwares. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. We've heard about gaps in our ability to understand, prepare, and to respond to potential pandemic emergencies. Uh, our software is designed to be able to be implemented in uh, hospitals or into uh, primary caregivers' offices and be able to, uh, to be the first stage of trying to track a virus. Uh, it works in, in uh, conjunction with uh, scheduling software or uh, triage software to be able to place the potential patient with other patients prior to have been um, processed through the hospital. Um, I would like to show a short presentation video of TGF Macaws Soft US new Virotrack software, uh, which is designed to identify track patients and all types of pandemic threats. Level of information depends upon role. International authority, federal authority, state authority, hospital administrator, or doctor. Vector one. The dashboard displays extensive information, easy to read format. View increased number of patients, number of cases geographically, types of viruses, all in real time. Cancer. Graph negative cases, uh, cases and patients diagnosed positive in the last 24 hour or positive negative case comparison and mortality totals. Pathology. Total cases per day, open closed cases, patients, positive cases, total positive cases, patient list, and small to-do list. Zoonotic diseases. Flag specific cases and shift to a higher authority through protocol keywords such as Ebola, anthrax, avian influenza. Immediately track a specific patient's medical path and pertinent information. Geolocation. Pinpoint hospitals, general practitioners' offices, and mobile units geographically. Locate personnel, assets, and patients in real time. Improve internal processes in terms of managing sterilization of assets and control of inventory. Improves internal processes in hospitals in terms of location and serves to know at what point the patient is at at all times. Tools which enable the creation of dynamic reports according to an individual or an organization's needs. Reports are automatically update tasks, sorting and distribution, and can also be printed for reports, I should add. Patients. Information regarding an individual case or multiple cases is user specific and displayed in real time.
As you can see, you can track the patient's path where they may have been located. Upon admission, a patient wearing ABGI's all-track bracelet can be tracked and monitored, whilst medical personnel and any tagged asset can be simultaneously tracked and recorded with relation to the patient's proximity. Ability to transfer medical files worldwide upon proper authenticated authorization from a primary caregiver. It was just a, a short video. We have very limited time, um, but uh, thank you for uh, thank you for uh, your attention to that. And uh, as you can see, our Viratrack software, in combination with ABGI's AllTrack hardware, is capable of tracking patients, potential emergencies, and pandemic emergencies, allowing authorities to anticipate and properly manage threats. Um, having said that, I believe I'm turning this over to Jimmy. Hi guys, I'm Jimmy Burgess. I'm a uh, software developer for ABGI and I'm going to show a short video here on our real-time location tracking uh, system that uses RFID tags to track uh, patients, equipment, supplies, uh, uh, anything in the hospital that you want to know uh, where it's been and um, with that I'll go ahead and do the video. AllTrack is a real-time location system that uses RFID tags and ultra-wideband frequency to track and monitor equipment, refrigerated units, patients, staff, and supplies within the hospital. AllTrack allows hospital staff to instantly find any tagged asset, prevent loss or theft, monitor sensor data including temperature, humidity, moisture, or biometric data, receive instant text alerts for unauthorized movement or if sensor data is out of range, and get a complete location and sensor history on tagged assets. The system is web-based and can be accessed anywhere on any device. All track RFID tags send data over ultra-wideband frequency. We originally developed this technology as a covert communications method for military tracking applications. UWB won't interfere with medical equipment or other technologies such as GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or cellular. It's low power and has a long battery life and high accuracy for tracking applications. Tagged assets appear on the facility map and you can view their position and movement in real time. The system prevents theft or loss by notifying administrators of unauthorized movement. In this example, the portable ultrasound machine has entered the lobby, an unauthorized area for this piece of equipment. Clicking on an item takes you to the detail page, which displays general information on the item and a full location history. This allows system administrators to see where the equipment has been and ensure that the equipment was sterilized after usage. Users can quickly search for any tagged item in the system and view its current location and any existing alerts. In addition to location data, all track RFID tags can interface with sensors to report environmental or biometric data. In this example, a refrigerated unit reports current ambient temperature, liquid temperature, and humidity. Administrators are instantly alerted by text message if a refrigerator is out of range. Temperature and alert history data help hospital staff verify the efficacy of drugs and vaccines stored in the refrigerator. AllTrack allows you to view all tagged equipment, staff, and patients that were in a specific room or area. In the event of a pandemic event, hospital administrators can minimize exposure to infectious diseases by monitoring equipment, staff, and patients to ensure proper preventative and sterilization protocols were implemented. So that's a quick uh, video on the software there. Um, after the, uh, the uh, presentation here, if you guys want to come up, I can uh, do a live demo of the software, and uh, if you have any questions on it, we could, uh, we could answer those. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I want to add is that, that we developed a sterilization tracking system that we're implementing with, with uh, Johnson & Johnson and Stryker Corporation for their surgical sets and trays and case cart management system of supplies. It's all about the hospitals having a, a set cost or a set 
reimbursement and in, in containing cost. Cost is the key in, in the hospital survivability. Most hospitals don't have a 2% margin ability or profitability and uh, our systems go in and, and utilize and save probably about a half a million to a million dollars per facility just by knowing where your assets are, your utilization turn rates against the disease state. And that's very, very critical. That's why J&J &J picked us, that's why uh, Stryker picked us to, to track their surgical sets and trays and, and their utilization. We find that, that a lot of medical devices and equipment go to patients and don't go through proper sterilization. They don't go to the decontamination room or clean, clean room. Um, when I did my internship at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, that's one of the things that we, we worked on diligently to do back in the 70s and, uh, and we, we automated the process now. Uh, right now, Jimmy's got a, a, a picture up of an RFID tag that we built for J&J &J with a separate battery system that has um, more than 10 years of life of tracking it. And it can take five atmospheres of pressure and 240, 50 degrees for 45 minutes. So it, it will take the sterilization and pressure, which is unique. The reason why we use ultra-wideband is because it doesn't have, we're biomedical engineers, it doesn't have any leakage current. Um, when one of the things when I built the reverse isolation transplant rooms for Dr. Christian Bernard, we couldn't have leakage current on any of the systems because it would affect the, the piggyback heart transplants. 10 microamps will cause fibrillation. So we developed the tags that have no RF leakage and have, have no, no uh, leakage that would cause fibrillation of the heart through an indwelled catheter, an IV. So a lot of these systems have been really thoroughly developed over a 30 year period of time for what was necessary to solve problems in the healthcare environment and the military environment, mostly at Fort Detrick. So, do you have any other pictures? Yeah, that's it. This is, this is unique. Uh, this is a badge tag that we developed for a hospital in Detroit. We had a number of cases where the nurses, over 3,000 cases of nurses being attacked in the car lots um, or in the parking garages in the nursing um, labor union came to us and asked us to create a tag that would instantaneously track the nurses going to their cars and they have a pressed red button for alert and it alerts the security on their iPhone where the person's at, that they're being, that they need help in, in, in an emergency and somebody should respond and it also gives them a tracking on the main security network too and that was very critical in developing that for identifying Anybody in case of a fire? Is everybody out? Patients? You know, where's your key staff at? Do they need help? Um, there's there's all kinds of utilizations of tracking this this uh, this employee badge for for those purposes. Anything else? This is our case cart system that we developed uh, for a Catholic hospital system that wanted to know the PAR values and the reordering and automatic and the authorization of who can take supplies and when some supplies are taken it automatically reorders and, and bills it to the, to the patient that it, it goes to if the patient has the ABGI band on. And so the idea is, is case cart management, reducing supply cost, um, managing supply costs, managing inventory costs in, in a critical environment as an operating room or um, an emergency room or other areas where they need critical supplies and it's associated with a patient when they come in. Especially for infection control purposes, the biggest loss of revenue to hospitals is secondary nosocomial infections. And in tracking the supplies, the people around that person, what Equipment's been assigned to that person. Is equipment being billed properly or cost accounted for properly? And basically, um, you know, that it's been sterilized before reissued again. And that's the main threat to, to the healthcare system is, is controlling the, the secondary nosocomial infections, so staph and strep and other diseases. Anything else, Jimmy? Yeah. Jim, can you talk a little bit, just for a few minutes, because you've got the experience in the DOD security environment. Uh, both in terms of your experience and how you've drawn upon that experience and built it into the data security, you have transmission because that's a lot of experience and some of the considerations and things that you have on experience there. Um, and also, as you talk through this, about how that patient flow and the patient and access and openness in our environments here makes 
the need for tracking more evident because we're so open parameter and, and how that plays into that? Yeah, with the growing cost of health care, the transparency of, of, of understanding your cost, your disease state management, your utilization of technology against that disease state so that you can stay profitable. Um, most hospitals have to make almost 10% profitability to replace new technology in the future. We work with ultra-wideband because ultra-wideband, number one, it takes a lot of technology to break it. Um, it's a digital pulse. It's in the 3.1 to 10.6 gigahertz range. It hops. We move it. Um, the digital pulses are, are also uh, sent out there and they're reassembled back at the receiver at the geoprocessor. And so those fractals are reassembled and, and it's very covert for that reason. It sits below the noise level of the lights, the fluorescent lights in the floor. Um, I even had uh, uh, an FBI expert come out that had been 40 years with the FBI on tracking RF signals and that, and we hit 11 devices and he couldn't find them and I showed him how to dial them in and then they hopped and moved. Um, that's the reason why we went to ultra-wideband. Also, too, from a medical standpoint, it didn't cause the leakage or the fibrillation of hearts through indwelled catheters. That's the other reason. It's the only thing that FDA has really approved for recording medical devices in an operating room. We tested the system for the leakage and everything else at Mayo Clinic and Vanderbilt University Medical Center with the children's and the heart ECMO unit. It's one thing that build a tracking device that goes in a warehouse. It's another thing to build one where you're working around a heart ECMO unit where the baby is one and a half pounds, has a hole in its heart, basically is on a heart ECMO machine and can't have any kind of leakage current that would cause fibrillation. Go ahead, Paul. Huh? I have three minutes? Okay. Um, I'm, did I answer enough for you? Yeah, well, I guess the other thing about it, I just... We've talked a little bit, and, and I find Jim fascinating, but one of the things for those of us that were involved in the Ebola situation that got all the national attention that's very different for some of these things is if you consider our hospitals, if you consider our healthcare system as compared to some of the more like Cuba or some of the other systems, we are a very open system. We let people come and go. In fact, we have this law that says people can bring whatever, whoever they want with them to the hospital. And so you come into the hospital with somebody that's exposed. We have the whole issue that they're going all over because we have a very open society. But if you think about your healthcare organizations, they come in and they can go all over, the employee can go all over, everybody else can go all over, their visitors can go all over. It's from a standpoint of spreading of disease, it's open door. And, and so you're a, one of the problems, if you watch that play out, which we had some very intimate involvement in, is that every healthcare provider is a sitting duck. So somebody came to a care now and sat there in the waiting room. And they looked like they had the flu. Somebody came to Texas Health Resources Hospital, Presbyterian, and they were there for a while, because you have to wait in the United States in a waiting room. And so they're going to Starbucks, they're going to the bathroom, they're, you know. And that's one of the things by the tracking as well as the modeling is, is something that we're all talking about. And I think we don't think about that so much. And so I just wanted to highlight that, because your contagious diseases, whether it's lice or ticks or Ebola or all of these other things or just the common flu, we've had swine flu, it spreads that way. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity. We've got about a minute left. I know Jim and those guys are going to be around. They're fascinating to talk to. I wanted to give you all a chance if you had any questions too before they wrap up. Any other questions? Everybody scared? <laughs> Jim, do you have any closing comments? The, the, the main comment that I have in closing is that we've developed a number of systems and we have the technology, we have the expertise that we've put together with, with the resources of multiple people, not just my own company, but other companies that we work, Clinetics and, and Ron, Ron's company. We all work together to create a system to track, monitor, and contain something at a cost-effective measure. And what's lacking is the either the political will or the financial will to set up these centers, whether it's on the borders or at healthcare centers, that when people come in, there's a screening and triage system that makes sure that they're not bringing an infectious disease in, especially when you don't know who they are. 
and they can affect your staff. I mean, Presbyterian, the cost of Presbyterian was enormous. Well, Presbyterian, was, Presbyterian lost across all of its hospitals overnight 60% of its patient base. 60%. They went from one of the most successful hospitals to overnight being in fear that they were going to go bankrupt. So when you think about the cost, and the priority on your risk, and it's not on most facilities' radar screens because it's been a long time since 2001 and all this modeling. And we just we think you need to include it because you could be the next THR. You're a sitting duck. You're a sitting duck. Paul, I'd like to ask a question. How many of you think that we're prepared for a uh, bio warfare attack? Well, you're right. How can we become prepared? Each of us has a responsibility, and that responsibility is to get this word out. And don't be satisfied with the apathy that's going on in Washington and everywhere else. Push your congressmen, push your senators. This has to be solved, because it's not a matter of if a bio-warfare attack occurs. It's a matter of when. Thank you. Can we give our uh, presenters a round of applause? And thank you so much for joining us today.